Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is Shank Talk Worldwide. My guest today is E. Michael Jones. Michael, thanks for joining us on the program today. Thank you. I'd like to discuss your latest book. Uh, it's entitled The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. When did the book come out? Uh, published in May of 2008, so just about two or three months ago. What does the book cover? covers 2,000 years of history from the foot of the cross to the uh, invasion of Iraq. And in the uh, book, you discuss the various revolutionary groups that were Jewish in origin. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, it also gets to the heart of what I mean by the Jewish revolutionary spirit. Uh, what I'm claiming in the book is that um, when the, 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 the term Jew is a theological construct. In order to understand what it means, you have to go back to the time when uh, Christ arrived on earth, and the Jews of that time had to either accept him or reject him. The Jews who accepted uh, Christ became known as Christians or the church. The Jews who rejected him are known as Jews today. And uh, what what happens over the course of uh, St. John's Gospel is the term Jew uh, changes from being an ethnic designation to being a theological designation, which means basically a rejecter of Christ. And I'm saying that in rejecting Christ, the Jews rejected Logos, and in rejecting Logos, they rejected the order of the universe, uh, including the social and moral order, and in doing that, they became revolutionaries. And they confirmed this uh, decision by choosing Barabbas over Christ. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Why do you think they continue to wage war against the majority population in the West, even as the society has become practically free of anti-Semitism to the point of reverence? Well, you know, old habits take a long time to die. And uh, we're talking about a habit of anti-Logos behavior that uh, began, as I say, at the foot of the cross. The Jews have always been a minority. They fear the minority. They fear the majority uh, when it's strong, and so they propose uh, strategies that um, weaken the strength of the majority. And uh, you know, things from alcohol production to pornography to uh, speech codes, you know, all sorts of things tend to weaken the uh, the majority, and they feel. I guess they feel more secure when the majority is weak. Who was Moses Hess, and how did he help bring about both uh, communism and Zionism? Moses Hess was a a, a revolutionary, uh, a German revolutionary friend of Karl Marx. Uh, but uh, during the course of uh, his career, he changed his tune from revolutionary internationalism to Jewish uh, Zionism, to believing and uh, came up with the idea that the, the Jewish people was going to be its own Messiah, and uh, expressed that in a book called uh, Rome and Jerusalem, which became one of the seminal texts for the Zionists at the end of the 19th century. So would you argue then that today the modern-day leadership of Israel, for instance, would be the offspring of the uh, Pharisees of Jesus' time? Well, I'm saying that there is a continuity between Jesus' time and our time. And uh, the continuity I see is in, in revolution. And so what you see over the course of history is one after the other of these uh, Jewish-inspired revolutionary movements that comes, rises, and falls. And so uh, at the time of the 19th century in Russia, in the Pale of the Settlement, where 80% of the world's Jews lived, there were two competing revolutionary ideologies. Uh, by, by revolution, I mean it in a kind of metaphysical sense, rejection of Logos, the attempt to create heaven on earth uh, by violent means. Uh, and these two ideologies would be communism and Zionism. And what you saw over the course of the 20th century was the rise and fall of communism, and I think what we're seeing now is the rise and fall of, of Zionism as well. Now, you mentioned Logos. Is this specific to... Uh Christian societies, or can it be generalized to any society? Logos is the Greek word for uh, word, uh, reason, order, principle. Uh, when the Jews, uh, I'm sorry, when the Greeks 
uh, talked about Logos, they were talking about the order of the universe. And so this would transcend any particular culture. Uh, it became part of Christianity because St. John wrote his gospel in Greek. And in use, the, the first sentence of St. John's gospel is, in arche en ha Logos. In the beginning, there was Logos. There was this order to the universe. And so it's really impossible to separate Christianity from this, from this Greek matrix. Uh, but, I mean, this is just a, a, a larger point in that it's impossible to separate Logos from human existence. Logos is the trace of reason or order or God's design in all of its creation. And this is very interesting to me because I've discussed this in my program many times regarding the uh, Jewish desire to build heaven on earth to uh, basically destroy Western civilization and Christianity and rebuild it in their image. Uh, they mention this in their own uh, religious and occult teachings. I believe it's called Tikkun Olam. And, yeah. and it's healing uh, the world, yeah. It's very fascinating because uh, it, this is something that I find is very important that people seem to miss. They deal with these issues of, of revolution, communism, Zionism, strictly from a political point of view. But I believe the spiritual side of it, or the occult side of it, is actually more revealing to the true nature of these uh, various uh, practices. Yeah, I don't think you can understand uh, Jews or Judaism uh, outside of a theological context. I'm saying the, the, book, the thesis of the book is that basically the Jew is a theological construct. It is based on rejection of Logos, and rejection of Logos leads to revolution. And so uh, political, I mean, I, I got started on this project because I began to realize that political labels were deceiving. Uh, it, it, you know, we, we just witnessed the fall of communism and uh, the triumph of uh, the American empire across the world. And all of a sudden you began to realize that there were similarities between these two empires, you know, uh, and the similarities revolved around, you know, a thinker like Trotsky, perpetual war, you know, one world class, all this type of stuff that you thought was associated with communism was now coming out in, in the American empire. And then when you looked at the major figures uh, who were promoting this, the, the neoconservative version of the American empire, you realize, well, well they were children of Trotskyites. Uh, Irving Kristol is the father of neoconservatism. He was a Trotskyite when he was a, uh, uh, a young man at City College in New York. His son, Bill Kristol, is uh, one of the big movers and shakers in the Republican Party, the tutor of Dan Quayle, and now it looks as if he's going to be the tutor of Sarah Palin as well. So uh, what, what I began to re I, I, so I began to see the inadequacy of these political categories, and what you saw below this was a kind of uh, theological substratum of, of based on the idea of revolution, heaven on earth, messianic politics. The other aspect of all of this is the fact that the Jews seem to be able to create various political movements, almost like they're creating a new set of clothes. And they can take these uh, clothes and just uh, exchange them with a with another set of clothes, but the uh, the true intent is still there. If the uh, if the intent of of Judaism is to destroy the Christian order, the established order, then you see some continuity between, let's say, the sexual revolution or the counterculture revolution, uh, Marxism neoconservatism, the uh, war in the Middle East, all of this starts to take on uh, similarities. You see, there, you see the continuity between all of these various independent movements, and the trick seems to be to uh, make the public believe that all of these things have happened independent of one another, that they are separate movements, and there's absolutely no relationship between these uh, various groups and various uh, movements throughout throughout history. Right. Anyone who uh, uh, sees some type of continuity is known as a conspiracy nut. But uh, the continuity is there. And uh, so it, it changes your political uh, hermeneutic or your, your interpretive tools. And what you begin to realize is that the terms left and right have just be have become virtually meaningless. 
as they have in this uh, current uh, electoral uh, campaign. Uh, and what becomes more important is, let's say, in recent American history, the position that the, that the Jews occupy uh, in political in the political uh, arena at a particular moment. So in the 50s, uh, the Jews would promote uh, subversion, uh, the lonely outsider, David Reisman's The Lonely Crowd, you know, the kind of beatnik uh, existentialist character uh, that uh, is alienated from society. In the 60s, the Jews would be prominent in the anti-war movement. Uh, but beginning in the 70s, when, they're, when they're, they become dominant in the culture, uh, let's say when Woody Allen lands on the cover of Time magazine and Philip Roth is celebrated as a great writer, Sudden, suddenly the whole parameter, the whole tenor of discourse changes. And then you realize that now it's the exact opposite of what it was in the 60s. Beginning in the 90s, the term political correctness emerges, and basically that's a, a Jewish... Uh, inspired uh, speech code and suddenly the people who were interested in maximizing freedom of expression when they were out of power are now interested in suppressing any type of political debate now that they have the uh, levers of power within their hands so it, it is, I think this helps in understanding what would otherwise be simply just too confusing uh, uh, a, a picture yes and the other aspect of this would be the fact that Jews today with dual citizenship to Israel are very prominent in our government. And the fact that they have a vested interest in seeing America get deeply involved in a war for, let's say, a hundred years in the Middle East to secure the realm for Israel, it would, it would, a question needs to be asked. How, how loyal are these government representatives? that have dual citizenship to Israel. Yeah, I think that's an issue. Uh, but the bigger, the bigger issue is whether we've all become Jews. And, and I, uh, by internalizing the, their rules of discourse. And so, uh, you know, the Washington Times reports that Sarah Palin has the Israel flag flying in her office, in the governor's office in Alaska. Well, you know, what, what, what we're being treated to is... Uh, I don't know how you want to call it, double standard or hypocrisy. Um, now, suppose Sarah Palin had the the, uh, the PLO flag flying in her office. You know, can can you imagine the type of uproar that would follow from this? You know, but but well, the but the issue you raised is the same issue. It's the question of loyalty to America. Whose whose interests are being represented here? And I think the debacle in Iraq and uh, the, the mess that the entire country is in as a result of this debacle in Iraq brings up the question of loyalty. You know, I mean, Catholics had to undergo this. They were always being accused of having dual loyalties to Rome or something like that. Uh, and they tried to work that out. But now it's, it's, you're not even allowed to raise the issue. And as a result, the, the discourse is becoming more and more disconnected from reality. I mean, I, I'm saying this presidential campaign is, a, is an example of this disconnect from reality. Nobody's talking about the issues. You know, nobody is allowed to talk about the issues in any, in any uh, critical fashion. Uh, you know, like we're supposed to think of Sarah Palin as the, uh, the pro-life evangelical and Joe Biden as the ethnic Catholic from Pennsylvania, even though he's from Delaware. But the subtext in both instances is loyalty to Israel. You know, Biden is a flaming Zionist. Uh, this is why he was chosen. If Obama were really interested in the Catholic vote, he could have chosen Senator Casey from Pennsylvania. But that's not the real subtext, and you're not allowed to talk about the real text here. Well, you've hit upon something that uh, I discuss quite often as well. Uh, the fact that this election cycle appears to me to be the first where Israel or those loyal to Israel have picked both candidates. I mean, uh, McCain. I don't think that's true. Well, I don't think that's true. I think it's been going. It may be more flagrant now, but uh, I think that's been the case for for a long time for a while anyway. I, I, I just can't I, I don't think we have we have had a choice 
for a long time. Well, I would agree with you uh, on one level, but what, I, what I'm suggesting is that McCain and, and Obama have really <clears throat> campaigned in Israel for this election. I mean, they went over to Israel to campaign to get the blessing of the uh, rabbis over there. The minute McCain came back from Jerusalem, he became the front runner in the uh, Republican nomination process. But, but I, well, I think I think that Obama is handicapped too. He's he, he's handicapped because he has basically these these uh, Jewish shackles on his mind. So, for example, when when the uh, when the uh, inc- when the invasion, the Russian invasion of Georgia took place, he, he couldn't really uh, make his point, or make a point uh, of differentiating himself from the Bush administration. He could have said that Shaka Svili was a neocon puppet installed by uh, subversive means, but he couldn't do it because he's. He, in other words, the, the parameters of discourse. Have been so controlled that nobody can. That, that even someone who is ambitious and wants to become president really can't break out of them and take advantage of political opportunities when they present themselves. Perhaps you're correct, and I, I should rephrase my statement to say that this is the most flagrant example of Zionist control over our political system. I've never seen it so flagrant. Even when Clinton was in office, the neocons presented their plan to invade the Middle East, and uh, Clinton turned down Richard Pearl and company with their uh, new uh, plan entitled Clean Break. He flatly yeah. refused to do it. But today, it's, it would be unheard of, unheard of for a president to turn down the neocons or turn down this idea to keep fighting in the Middle East. This has become our, our cause now. This is, this is why we exist, to, uh, to fight Islamofascism, which is a completely made-up term. Yeah. How did the Zionists get this much control? Could you elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, yeah, I could talk about 20 centuries of, uh, you know, waxing and waning of, of, of Jewish power. But I, I think I could kind of distill it in, in, a, in a nutshell and give you sort of the dynamic of revolution. There have never been enough Jews to bring about a revolution all by themselves, not even in, in, the Soviet, uh, in Russia in 1917, when they did have a lot of, of Jewish involvement in that. The, the, this, this, the situation is pretty much always the same. Um, the, the, the Goyim are offered liberation, and it usually means liberation from the moral order, and it usually means sexual liberation. And so they see some type of liberation. They go for that. They abandon the moral law. Uh, they abandon God's law. And once you abandon that, you end up being captured uh, by, by the Jews, by the Jews who were behind the revolution. That's, that's a dynamic that happens over and over and over again. Uh, throughout history. And it's the, probably the central dynamic of the book that I'm talking about. So it could be, you know, uh, let's say take it at the beginning of the revolutionary movement in Europe, the Hussites, uh, basically monks who were sick of living uh, the life of monks and nuns, you know, this life of celibacy and so on and so forth. And so they act out their little drama, revolutionary drama, by reading the Old Testament and seeing themselves as Old Testament prophets, uh, all the way up to the, the sexual revolution of the 60s, abortion. Uh, gay rights, all of these things, pornography, the liberalization of pornography. It's basically the same dynamic. You want some type of liberation from something that is really the basis of your freedom. The moral order is the basis of your freedom. If you see it as some type of onerous burden, that's your problem. Here, you've got a spiritual problem that you should correct. But if you get enough people who act on it and they overthrow this, the fact of the matter is that you're going to end up being ruled by some type of totalitarian Jewish messianic political operation. Well, you've hit upon something that's very fascinating, especially because this affects both sides of the issue, the people that are Zionist and the people that are anti-Zionist. They both seem to agree, agree that the moral order should be turned over, the moral order should be destroyed. Christianity is bad. You see atheism just uh, growing uh, immensely in, in this country. I've never seen anything like this in my life. P- 
people that I that I deal with on a day to day basis, a large majority are atheistic. What is the uh, Jewish relation to atheism? The Jews will promote it to weaken the dominant culture in cultures that are uh, religiously based. And so, for example, Sigmund Freud, I guess, is the classic example of that. You know, living in Catholic Austria comes up with this basically uh, a form of of, uh, sexual liberation that is really basically a form of control. Uh, I mean, I've, I've talked about Freud in other books. I talk about him more in Libido Dominandi. But the fact of the matter is that he was a, a, a Jewish revolutionary. And his theories got refined by his pupil, uh, Wilhelm Reich, and then they got implemented in the United States during the 60s, which is basically promote sexual liberation as a form of political control. And that's the world we live in right now. You know, so, th- th- you know, uh, the, the, the one moment in the book... Uh, where I think that the the church, which is the the primary anti-revolutionary force uh, in this the history of the West, where they become conscious of this, was a series of articles that appeared in Civiltà Cattolica, which is the kind of quasi-official Vatican uh, magazine run by the Jesuits, and it appeared in 1890, which was uh, the time of the celebration, 100th anniversary celebration of the French Revolution. And it was just a kind of stunning uh, summary of what I'm talking about because basically they said, where do we stand now? We're ruled by people whose names are like Rothschilds and Bischofheim and stuff like that. And how did this happen? And basically they said any country that rebels against God's law in some dramatic way, and the French Revolution was certainly that, will end up being ruled by Jews. And that's the dynamic that, I, that has been repeated over and over and over again. And that's, I think, the dynamic that we're living right now. We are living in the sequel of the sexual revolution of the 60s, where a, a group of people bought into this, and uh, it was manipulated by the Jews, and the sequel of sexual liberation is political correctness, speech codes, hate crimes, all of this type of imposition of thought control, and then the mobilization of the country uh, for wars uh, for the benefit of Israel. And yet people that espouse atheism will say that this is the only defense against what you're describing, the Jewish takeover of society, of civilization. The only way now, who is saying? I, I'm curious to know who, who is saying that. I, I haven't heard any atheist saying this. Well, the atheist. I mean, Christopher Hitchens, for example, to give you one prominent atheist these days, is a flaming philo semite. Claims Jew. Uh, you know, claims he discovered he was Jewish himself. I, I just don't see atheism, uh, uh, the organized atheism, as, as uh, proposing some type of antidote to this. To uh, you know, let's say the behavior, Israeli behavior with the Palestinians, or anything like that. Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, for instance, this this usually comes out of the white nationalist quarters, people that belong to these white nationalist groups or espouse that philosophy. They will say that Christianity is Jewish, uh, Judaism is Jewish, and the belief in God is a Jewish concept. Therefore, we need to break away from belief in God and and go back to, let's say, paganism, go back to atheism, where we believe in ourselves and what we can do. This is a theme in many, many white nationalist groups. Uh, In fact, you see this during World War II. This was a theme that Alfred Rosenberg uh, made popular. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, could you address that a little bit? Uh, Yeah, I mean, if you take the Nazis as an example, they became crypto-Jews. They they espouse the same racial philosophy that the Jews have espoused. You know, it's, it, it, what you saw was basically the flip side of the same coin, which led to basically catastrophe because of their racial understanding of what it meant to be a Jew. Uh, so I, I I see this as as part of the dialectic. In other words, the antithesis is every bit as bad as the thesis, and the thing goes around and around in circles as a result of that. I don't see, if if you view the Jew in racial terms, as the Nazis did, then you have to exterminate him if you think he's bad, okay? And that's what led to that whole catastrophe. And it led to the resurrection of Jewish power as a result. So what I'm trying to propose here is a, 
a way out of that dialectic by going back to the original uh, way that the West had to deal with the Jews, which was basically the Catholic way, which was uh, articulated by Greg- St. Gregory the Great uh, in the 7th century and by basically every medieval pope after that. And that's it's called secret Judeus non, and the first principle is no one has the right to harm the Jew, and the second principle is, on the other hand, the Jew has no right to subvert uh, uh, Christian culture. So this, according to this construct, the Jew is uh, it's a choice that Jews make, and the choice is rejection of Christ. And if they reject the rejection of Christ, well, then that's the end of the problem. And that was always the medieval solution. And it, it did have success. I mean, there were massive conversions of Jews by the end of the uh, by the end of the 15th century, so many conversions that caused another problem, namely the Converso crisis in Spain. But that's that's what I'm trying to articulate. The, back to the traditional way of dealing with this issue, because the the racial uh, attempt to deal with it is first of all wrong. I don't see any racial continuity here. But secondly, it failed as well. And I think the same thing is going to be true of the the atheistic. Uh, approach to this issue. You, you can't you can't approach this unless you approach it in theological terms. And so the atheist version, whether it's neo paganism or whatever, is going to end up with some type of racial version that's this, just going to make the problem worse. In addition to that, the atheists don't seem to offer any any substitute for the moral code of Christianity. I, I, I mean, it's one thing to say let's get rid of the old system and let's rebuild something new. But they offer nothing other than their non-belief. There's no moral substitute. There's nothing. There's no new system of morality. I just I don't I don't see it as a as a, a substitute for the moral code of Christianity. I just don't see it. I don't either. Uh, it, it seems to me people take for granted our ideas of right and wrong. Uh, they just seem to think we're born with these ideas. Somehow we're born. We we wake up one day and we know right from wrong. Because well, we are. We do to a certain extent. The moral law is written on the human heart, uh, but it's subjected to all sorts of passion, and that's why you need education. You need to you know create habits where you're going to be choosing good over evil. You know, so it's both. It's not as if you know it, there is no. In a sense, there's no Christian moral code. Moral, morality is part of the human constitution. It's logos. The fact that you're a human being means that you have uh, have to make choices, and you have to make choices according to criteria, and the criteria are known as right and wrong. So there's no way of getting around that. You have to do it. Uh, and so the question is, uh, well, what's the best way to, to promote that? And Christianity is an affirmation of that by the, the person who is Logos, you know, the living Logos, the living Word. And so he can strengthen you in these decisions, and enough people get together, they will have a culture where it's easier to choose right over wrong. But th- th- these cultures are always uh, in danger of being subverted. And that's the story that I tell in this book of the subversion of one culture after another by the forces of anti-Logos, or otherwise known as the Jewish revolutionary spirit. It's always interesting when you see a society, though, like, well, today, one, one answer, one substitute for religion or for Christianity is science. Science seems to be the answer now. This is how we should build our societies on the moral code of science. Now, what we find, though, when man is the uh, one who designs the moral code, the moral code can change from one generation to the next. One thing comes to mind, the idea of exterminating babies that are sick or old people that are useless eaters. This could be considered very moral and very just if, you're, if your idea of morality is based on science. You're one, you want to breed a healthy population so you get rid of all of the useless eaters and all the people that have genetic defects. But this would be completely immoral in a Christian society. This is one of the points I would like to make. How do you how do you address the idea of science? What what we see today is people trying to use science as a new religion. I think it's I think that day is past. I mean, if you're talking about the Anglo, the English speaking world, 
it sort of re, you know there was Newton and that became the uh, the basis for the Whig sort of uh, psychological warfare attack on on uh, on Europe on France and then there was Darwin and what you're talking about is basically a, a loss of faith among the ruling class elites in the Anglo Anglophone world happened in this country and so I, I would say that the high point of science as religion would have been right at the period right after World War II uh, when a lot of these changes were imposed on American society. Uh, I think at this point it's kind of wearing thin uh, and I think that people are realizing that you, you can only go so far in spite of the fact that all of these people, you know, we're constantly having these gurus placed before us, like the late Carl Sagan. Uh, you know, we're constantly hearing about Darwin and this, that, and the other thing. But I think that what's, what we're, what you, what you're beginning to see now is that this was all just a front for, for appetite and for power. I mean, basically, Darwin provided a cover, a, a, a rationalization for the, the economic practices of the English ruling class, and the American ruling class after world after the Civil War between the Civil War and World War II, they liked it too. They wanted to emulate that, and so they implemented these things. Uh, but but I think now we're, everyone sees through it. You know, I mean, it's it's basically the religion of wealth and power. All of these things come to survival of the fittest. What does that mean? It's a it's a meaningless statement. What it means is basically. The people, the truth is the opinion of the powerful, as Thrasymachus has said way back when Plato was writing. So I, I don't, I don't think that's the issue anymore. I think that I don't think that's the way people feel. I think people are starting to see through this, and we're starting to see basically that these are, you know, the, the theological issues are never going to go away. The moral issues are never going to go away, you know, no matter how they're disguised. So let's address them directly. It seems like genetics now is being used as a science to make excuses for people's immoral behavior. For instance, if you're homosexual, it's because you were born that way. It's in your genetic code. If you are an alcoholic, it's because you're genetically predisposed to being an alcoholic. This seems to be the new science that they are using to justify immoral behavior or, let's say, antisocial behavior. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. Uh, but the fact that you're portraying it this way means that it must be failing because we're all starting to see through this. There's a, an interesting book out, uh, History of uh, Psychology in America, and it was uh, Princeton University Press, and I've forgotten the name of the uh, author. Uh, but it basically is the history of uh, Jewish psychology in America. Uh, or the Jewish contributions of psychology. And in each instance, what you see is basically psychology was being used as a weapon uh, to attack the, the majority, attack and weaken the majority population. So all the way from Sigmund Freud all the way up to, uh, you know, uh, the advice columnist, you know, uh, Ann Landers, the letterer sisters, uh, Abigail from Van Buren, they were two sisters, uh, Joyce Brothers, you name it. What we see is psychology being used by the Jews as a weapon to weaken the majority. Now, this is book written by a Jew, put out by you know one of the big university presses. I went on, gave, did a book review of it, and then went on television, a local show here, talked about. Basically, it just was a book review, but I was attacked as an anti-Semite for saying the same thing that the author of the book said. Now, this is a kind of, you know, the kind of double standard in discourse that has become intolerable as far as I'm concerned. We just, you know, we can't have a culture like ours, which is supposedly based on all this discussion so that you can make informed decisions, if every time you open your mouth on certain topics, you're shouted down and you're, you're told that you're a wicked person. But what I'm saying here is that each of these these fads sort of runs its course, runs its course, and in the end, we come back to the old traditional beliefs in the good and the, the true, and uh, nothing is going to supersede them. So let's just start being, being honest and dealing with this uh, on the on its real terms, rather than you know being stuck in one more fad one more time. The other day, I was listening to the radio, and there was a talk show host who had a caller. 
and the caller came in and said that her son wanted to be a girl. He was a little a little boy, about five, six years old, and he told his mommy he wanted to be a girl. The talk show host, who's a psychiatrist, said that the boy was probably transgender and that he should see a doctor who specializes in this type of affliction or this type of condition. And I thought it was just stunning that the, the uh, psychiatrist would jump to this conclusion without asking the lady, well, does your son watch television? Does he have an older brother who's gay? Does, does he hang around with older kids who have family members that are gay? I mean, there's a lot of answers that you might want to, you might want to investigate before you jump to the conclusion that your son is transgendered simply because he says, I want to be a girl. This seems to be popular today, the idea that my son is born gay. Uh, again, with the genetics, the gen genetic science, uh, I'm an alcoholic because I'm genet genetically predisposed. I overeat because I'm genetically predisposed. This seems to be very popular. So even though you and I might recognize it as being a fallacious argument, it seems like it's very, very popular because it... It makes people feel good about themselves, and that seems to be... Well, it lets be... them off the hook. Yes, yes. Uh, it, in other words, it it's ex exculpates. In other words, if you're born that way, you've got no, uh, you've got no culpability. But, but but even that even that's that that's not true. I mean, this, this is the co clear intention behind, you know, the gay gene research. There's no evidence whatsoever that uh, homosexuality is determined genetically. None whatsoever. Okay, the classic, uh, for, the classic explanation has been reaffirmed lately. Uh, father deprivation uh, has always been the class. Even Sigmund Freud believes that, and that's been reaffirmed, I think, more and more. And the, the attack on on North and these other uh, reparative therapy groups is an indication that they're on to the right thing. You know, the gender engineers don't want to hear that. Okay, but but let's take let's take an instance where I think the genetic argument does make sense, and that is alcoholism, because uh, I think that the alcohol has to affect the body in a certain way, and they've done studies where twins that were separated at birth, both of them have this predisposition toward alcoholism because the alcohol has to affect your body. If it doesn't affect your body in a certain way, you're not going to find it pleasurable, and it's not going to become the dominant thing in your life. It, it, no one is claiming that because you have a genetic predisposition toward alcoholism that you can go out and drive drunk. No one's claiming that. So here, it's it's just one of these instances where, oh, well, that's different. Well, no, it's not different. It's the same thing. You know, even if there were a predisposition that you had, it would be your job to control it. That's what they say about alcohol. So why wouldn't it be the truth? About, why wouldn't that be true of homosexuality or any other this, uh, appetite that needs to be controlled by reason? So it's just one more instance of you know double standard, the dishonesty, use of science as a way of justifying uh, behavior that will ultimately be forms of control. It also illustrates what you bring up in your books, especially the new book, regarding the Jewish revolutionary spirit. If the idea is to destroy the existing order, then it would uh, be beneficial to this to this agenda to readjust the idea of normal versus abnormal. Right. This is very, very important. This is what I see as a major theme today. Even with Sarah Palin, she was discussing her child who has Down syndrome saying that he's normal, just like everyone else. The idea that a retarded child is normal, this is where Christianity differs. Christianity would not look at that child as being normal, but they would look at the child with compassion and want to take care of the child simply because that's what you're supposed to do. It's, it's Christian. Right, right. And so I think what, you're, what you see here is a war on the idea of nature. Nature means something that is sort of ordained by God. It's part of the logos of the universe. And what you're seeing here is an attempt to eradicate this concept from sexual behavior. But what I'm saying, and so, you know, okay, people like Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey, were big uh, proponents of this approach. 
but what I'm saying is that this is always a prelude to some type of, some form of control. Because if there's no nature, then the people who have power determine what is right and what is wrong. And that's the end of the story. And that's sort of always the hook inside the worm here. You know, all we see, you know, we're like fish, and all we see is the worm, but we don't see the hook inside of it. That's the hook inside the worm. Do you address the American Revolution in your in your book, in the new book? Only obliquely. I take up the American experience with uh, the Civil War with uh, John Brown, Frederick Douglass, and uh, his affair with his uh, half Jewish German uh, girlfriend, Ottilie Ossing. And what I say here is essentially that there was a homegrown revolutionary spirit in America that came from the Puritans. The Puritans were Judaizers, no question whatsoever. I have a whole chapter explaining that. And uh, in England, there was a repudiation of Puritanism, but it never really happened in America. So Puritanism and the Enlightenment sort of grew up side by side in America, and you can see this in the writings of Tom Paine. And so by the time of the, the Civil War era, what you had was a, a whole, the, the native-grown American Puritan tradition, had revolutionary tradition, had surfaced again as the abolition movement. And this was basically Boston, which had been the center of the Puritan revolutionary activity. And then there was a confluence here of the revolutionary movement coming together, uh, coming to America from Germany, uh, the, re the failed revolution of 1848. These people sort of flowed into America, and you had kind of like a binary weapon, and that was sort of the Civil War. And that was the beginning of the, uh, what should I say, the, the resurrection, the, let's say the, 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 the American uh, America has this kind of revolutionary herpes uh, uh, virus in its DNA, and it flares up periodically. And so after a lull, it flared up with the Civil War, which was another revolutionary movement. And then it just, it just never went away, you know. And it would be activated again by the, the influx of other revolutionary movements. And so, for example, in the 1890s, when the Tsar cracked down on uh, the Russian Jews, uh, when he nationalized the alcohol production in the uh, Pale of the Settlement, large numbers of Russian Jews came to America. And again, you had this more in introduction of new revolutionary ferment, you know. And that is basically what gave us Irving Kristol, and Irving Kristol is what gave us the, uh, the neocon, which is probably the most virulent form of revolutionary activity we've had in our history. One of the questions that I always ponder is the uh, founding fathers' decision to leave slavery alone. It has been a curse to this country, and we're still we, we are still dealing with it today. If you investigated, people like Aaron Lopez and uh, Hiram Solomon were very very wealthy slave merchants who uh, financed the American Revolution. I'm wondering if any of your research has discovered their influence on the Founding Fathers' decision to leave the institution of slavery alone? Well, I think the, the institution of slavery being left alone was a political compromise. And so uh, what, I, what I'm saying is by the, top, by the middle of the 19th century, there were two documents that contradicted each other. The two documents are the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States is a practical document. The Declaration of Independence is an ideological document. And so basically the abolitionists said that the real document was the Declaration of Independence, which said that all men are created equal and that the Constitution was illegitimate and deserved to be thrown out. So there was, there was a, 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 a the, the founding of the country was a compromise. It was a compromise on a lot of different uh, issues, uh, and slavery was one of them. You know, in other words, we need to come together. We're, this is, there's nothing we can do about it. We'll just have to accommodate it. But the dynamic, the inter-revolutionary dynamic wouldn't let it rest, and that flared up at the time of the Civil War. That's an interesting period of time, because you had a very powerful Jew who was uh, Jefferson Davis's uh, assistant or right-hand man. Judah Benjamin. Yes, yes. 
What role did he play in the South? Did you do any research on him? Well, I mean, just at the tail end, uh, basically, where, you know, if, if, if what, you, what you're seeing here um, is basically that the South had no, no feeling one way or the other about Jews. They were not significant enough to have any feeling. And, and uh, Judah Benjamin was an example of, well, a Jew can be for the South, too, so why, why should we have any animus against these people? The only person who uh, was involved in anti-Jewish activity was Ulysses S. Grant, who banned the Jews from his sector of the uh, of the South because they were ch they were cheating people. Uh, all of this changed with the with the Leo Frank trial uh, in around 1915. Uh, Frank was the owner of a pencil factory, a manager of a pencil factory, and. Uh, a young employee, 13 year old employee, Mary Fagan, was found murdered, and he was accused of the murder. And uh, the Jews immediately overreacted and said that this was another Dreyfus case, this was Mendel Bellis, this was all this type of stuff that was going on. And the, the Southerners were shocked because they had no reason to, to have any anti Semitic feelings because the Jews were simply not part of what was their, their issue. If they were bigoted, they would have they would have accused the black uh, manager uh, Jim Conley of the crime. And here they were conducting a trial and so on, and uh, they were stunned. And gradually, the, the the position solidified so that the entire nation, under the leadership of Jewish newspapers like the New York Times, basically came to con were convinced that Frank was innocent. But after seven trials and seven appeals, including the Supreme Court, the state of uh, Alabama uh, was convinced that uh, the due process has been had been uh, uh, given. He'd been given due process, and that he was convicted, and he deserved to, to his punishment. So the, the net result was that the governor uh, pardoned him, and then uh, a mob uh, broke in and lynched him. And at this point, the the Jews declared war on the South. And the culmination of that war was the civil rights movement of the of the 1960s, which was largely fu largely funded by Martin Luther King. People like that were largely funded by by New York Jews, uh, and uh, the, the the great uh, the man who broke up the Black Jewish Alliance, uh, the uh, former the professor at uh, at uh, of Black Studies at the University of Michigan, Harold Cruz. The crisis as a Negro intellectual said that basically this was uh, revenge for Leo Frank. So that is, in a sense, that how that uh, came about. What effect do you think the Jews have had on the Catholic Church, the modern Catholic Church? Well, the big event, of course, was Vatican II, uh, when they uh, and the, the Vatican II document Nostra Aetate. And of course, now you, in that instance, you have to distinguish between what Nostra Aetate actually said and what the Jews said it said. Uh, what it actually said was that uh, uh, you know not all Jews at the time of Christ should be held responsible for his death. And but it went on to say that you know the Church is the new Israel. Well, what the Jews have been saying, and uh, and this came, all came out in the 40th anniversary celebration of Nostra Aetate in 2005. The Jews are saying that the church admitted that it was wrong, admitted that supersessionism was wrong, namely that the church had superseded Israel. Well, this was all just purely made up. Uh, uh, so it became, it became basically Nostra Aetate became a weapon in the Jewish arsenal of cultural warfare, and it effectively neutered the church's ability in de to deal with Jewish uh, subversion of culture. The first casualty... I would say was uh, the Legion of Decency, which was basically uh, the Catholic attempt to keep obscenity out of Hollywood. Uh, the production code had succeeded for 30, let's say uh, 33 to 65, 34 to 65, 31 years of keeping obscenity out of Hollywood films. The Jews broke the code in 65 and, and because basically the Catholics ran up the white flag. And I think it was largely because of Nostra Aetate. It seems like the Catholics are the only group out there right now that even put up any resistance to the uh, Jewish onslaught on our morality. At least they used to. I don't know. They seem to be retreating. 
I guess the final straw will be when uh, the Catholic Church allows gay priests and female priests. Do you see this coming down the pike? No, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. I mean, the, the sexual battle was fought in the last papacy. When John Paul II became Pope in 78, the sexual battle was raging, and there were lots of people who felt that, you know, it was only a matter of time before there would be, you know, uh, contraception is approved, abortion's okay, homosexuality is okay, the whole modern agenda. But he held firm on that, and so it's it's just not going to happen. The real issue, though, became the, the, the Jewish issue. And so you had things like John Paul II, who, you know, grew up with Jews and was personally, uh, you know, personally friends with them and stuff like that, just couldn't, just could not deal with the, with this issue, just could not deal with the issue. And so you have moments like uh, the Pope going to the Wailing Wall. Well, this is, this is an incredibly ambiguous gesture. What does that mean? When Jews go to the Wailing Wall, they're praying for the restoration of the Temple. Well, no Pope could ever pray for, pray for the restoration of the Temple. That's preposterous. And so what you're seeing now, he let that go and go until finally, now with the new papacy, the Jews were convinced that the, the Catholic Church was going to repudiate the core, one of its core beliefs, namely that everyone needs Jesus Christ to be saved. You cannot be saved if you reject Jesus Christ. And they thought that they were going, the, the Catholic Church was going to affirm dual covenant theology, which was basically, well, the Jews have their covenant, and they can be saved by rejecting Jesus Christ, but you have to be saved by following Jesus Christ. Well, that's preposterous, and it didn't happen. And what happened uh, just this year is in, two, in January, the Pope rewrote the prayer calling for the conversion of the Jews, which set them off. And then Walter Kasper, who was a flaming proponent of dual covenant theology, had to recant in an article in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. And then finally, just a month ago, the American bishops just removed a statement from their catechism which stated that the Mosaic covenant was eternally valid. Now that's unpressed. You know, bishops never do this type of thing. But it was so flagrantly heretical and such a flagrant a contradiction of the central tenet of Christianity, namely that you need Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ, to be saved, that they had to take it out. So I think that now we're seeing a course correction on the, on the, the Jewish issue of the sort that we saw on sexual issues under uh, John Paul II. I have to ask this question regarding the Jesuits. The Jesuit uh, group, do you believe that they were infiltrated by Jews at one time, or is this just complete conspiracy theory nonsense? Let me give you, you know, the most famous subversion story that I know in my book with the Jesuits. It was Malachi Martin. Malachi Martin was an agent of the American Jewish Committee and of uh, the ADL and worked for the Jews to subvert Catholic teaching at the Second Vatican Council. So, I mean, it did happen with Malachi Martin. Uh... And uh, so, you know, it's not impossible. That's the, the example I deal with in my book. The Jesuits have fallen on hard times lately. They've become, they've succumbed to all of the uh, modern ideologies, and you know, maybe they will, maybe that boat will right itself. Maybe it won't. I don't know. Time will tell. Can you give us some more detail about Malachi Martin? That's a fascinating uh, topic. I didn't, I was not aware of that. Yeah, Malachi Martin was working. Uh, the Jesuits have a, a, a the Biblicum, their uh, scriptural college in Rome. He was an assistant to Cardinal Bea. Uh, Jules Isaac met with John the Twenty Third, asked him to remove the teaching of hate, and so John uh, the Twenty Third referred him to Cardinal Bea, and Cardinal Bea decided that the council needed to write a statement on the Jews. At this point, Malachi Martin became the agent of Jewish subversion of the Second Vatican Council. This has all been documented. It's in the New York Library. If you look up uh, the uh, the papers of, uh, uh, who, who are they, uh, Joe Lichter or uh, Schuster, the guy for uh, the AJC, uh, basically, they used uh, New York publishing houses as the uh, money laundering operation to get money from the Jewish uh, organizations to Malachi Martin. It's also documented in Robert Blair Kaiser's book, uh, Clerical Error. Robert Blair Kaiser was a Times correspondent in Rome 
for the Vatican Council. He was an ex-Jesuit and so felt a natural affinity to uh, Malachy Martin. They became friends, and then Malachy used that as a way of seducing uh, Kaiser's wife and uh, used uh, Jewish money as a way of spreading his influence uh, and subverting the church's teaching at the council. He didn't get what he wanted, but that doesn't change uh, his intention or the intentions of the Jewish organizations that paid his bills. Seventy-five. President Joe Porter scored the second attempt of his life. Sarah Jane Moore was arrested for trying to shoot the president outside a San Francisco hotel. And on this day in 1862, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. His decree set a date for the emancipation of more than three million slaves and recast the Civil War as a fight against slavery rather than a struggle to reunite the states. And that's this day in history. Let's return to Shank Talk Worldwide with Peter Shank fighting the war of perception five days a week. Only on the voice of reason. Dare to know. I'd like to move on to your other book here, Dionysus Rising. In that book, you make an argument, a very convincing argument, that this cultural revolution actually originated with music, more specifically with Wagner. Uh, this is where you begin your journey with Wagner, and you move on through uh, Schoenberg, and then, of course, to modern rock and roll music during the 60s. Can you start with Wagner very quickly and uh, explain how Wagner could be considered the grandfather of this uh, free love cultural revolution, so to speak. Yeah, well, Va Wagner was a revolutionary. He was involved in the revolution of 1848, uh, was convicted of treason, and then had to escape uh, in exile to uh, Switzerland. And what, I, what I'm saying is that uh, while in exile in Switzerland, he switched from being a political revolutionary to being a sexual revolutionary. The political revolution failed, but the sexual revolution was just waiting to happen. And the vehicle for sexual revolution for Germany, certainly for the latter half of the 19th century, was Wagner's opera, Tristan und Isolde. And one of the first victims of this was a young uh, a teenager by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who became famous later. He became a devotee of Wagner after hearing Tristan und Isolde. And according to some accounts, and I, I tend to think they're true, he, Nietzsche deliberately infected himself with syphilis in a kind of demonic pact uh, to dedicating himself to sexual, uh, re uh, sexual liberation. So that was the beginning of it in Germany, and uh, it reached a kind of... The music developed... And uh, it was taken over by a a Jew, a Jewish revolutionary uh, by the name of Arnold Schoenberg, who then uh, became a Christian, and then after he became a Christian, became uh, involved with the Bohemian crowd in Vienna. And as a result of that, his wife had an affair. And as a result of having his wife his wife's affair, he became so infuriated at Christian culture that he decided to destroy its music. And that was uh, the beginning of atonal music and leading up to 12-tone music, which was basically uh, Jewish revenge on the West because of the infidelity of Schoenberg's wife. You make, uh, a, you, make a great, you make a great argument, though, in your book regarding atonal music versus harmonious music. There's some sort of spiritual symbolism there. Yeah, I'm saying that uh, the tonality is part of nature, and we are instinctively respond to it. And so, when you return to the chord that you give the note that you began, the chord that you began, which is what it means to play in one key, you feel the sense of uh, resolution. 
so the passions are aroused and then they're resolved at the end, and that's the kind of catharsis that we feel by listening to a good piece of music. Wagner broke with this with uh, chromaticism, which is basically switching keys in the middle so that you never really return, and that became a symbol for this kind of sexual uh, sexual stimulation ad infinitum. And he talks about, in personal terms, he talks about, Tannhäuser is a good uh, opera to look at because, especially the Paris version, the uh, Venusberg is all chromatic, but the Pilgrim's Chorus, which is the strongest part, is tonality. So he's sort of torn between, one, you know, am, am I going to be a Christian or am I going to engage in sexual liberation in the Venusberg? And uh, that's what that that's what that opera is about. Well, Tristan and Isolde resolves that by saying, "I'm going to stay in the Venusberg and go on with sex, sexual stimulation ad infinitum." But the problem the problem is that when Schoenberg got a hold of it and wrecked his uh, revenge on Wagner's music, because I think he held Wagner's music responsible for his wife's infidelity, and so now he's going to destroy. That which he saw as the the music of the West. What happened is the music became so unattractive that nobody could listen to it. You, you, there was George Antheil said if we had to listen to one more piece by Schoenberg, we all would have committed suicide. And, and so he says it was with great relief that uh, the first jazz band arrived in Paris in 1919. And so what happened is that the vehicle for sexual liberation went from being Wagnerian, Tristan and Isolde, chromaticism to jazz, basically, Negro jazz. And that's what it continued to be up until, you know, let's say 1969 when we had those great Dionysian festivals, uh, Woodstock and, and Altamont. And by that time, it had become Negro Dionysian jazz had become the vehicle of sexual revolution, and that was the sort of the vehicle of the cultural revolution of the 1960s. Wagner met uh, a Russian anarchist by the name of Bakunin, and he was uh, very uh, influenced by him. Can you uh, uh, give us a little rundown on that meeting between Wagner and well, Bakunin? I, yeah, Baku, Bakunin uh, was, you know, busy chopping down trees to prevent the advance of the Prussian army. And Wagner, I think, in seeing Bakunin, realized, I can never be like this guy. I'm just not cut out to do this kind of stuff. And I think that's what convinced him to change to become a musical revolutionary. And I think as, as a result of that, he had much more influence than he would have had in any political revolution. I think that Wagner ultimately had more influence over the way the world is now than Bakunin did. And Nietzsche was very influenced by uh, Wagner's music, but then at some point he became very disenchanted with Wagner. Yeah, Wagner never overcame that uh, that attraction to Christianity, and so at the end of his life, he wrote Parsifal, which is a very pious. I mean, from a musical point of view, it's an incredibly devout and fervent uh, homage to the Eucharist. And Nietzsche was appalled by this, and so he broke with uh, Wagner and uh, attacked his mentor, and uh, you know, became the father of nihilism. Uh, as a result of that, in his latter days, he became a big fan of of black music, African music, so to speak, and he uh, foretold the future when he mentioned that the destruction of the or the sexual revolution will come from the dark continent, something of that effect. Yeah, the, the Europeans had this fantasy about uh, about Africa, uh, and it wasn't just Americans. You know, because Americans had all these black people living there, and the, the it be pretty pretty by the 1920s, jazz became this kind of Jewish fantasy, the Ju a Jewish creation. But it was the fantasy of uh, uh, the Negro as a paradigm of sexual liberation. You know, this liberated darky that just you know didn't have the same rules. Well, the Europeans felt that way about Africa, and uh, both Nietzsche and Jung used to look to the to the dark continent as the kind of uh, the liberation from Christian sexual morality, but it was it, it was essentially a, a, a European fantasy, and ultimately it, it was that was not what the issue that's not what the issue was in Europe. The issue in Europe was basically Dionysus and the worship of Dionysus 
and this German sort of this fatal attraction among Germans towards sexual liberation leading to some type of death, which Thomas Mann really summarizes in uh, in Death in Venice, where that, that I think that's the best pa- the best passage in German literature describing a Dionysian festival is in Thomas Mann's Death in Venice. In your book, uh, you've got a chapter here on Nietzsche on page 85. Uh, it says here, in his book on the Harlem Renaissance, Nathan Irvin Huggins traces white desire to Freud and the new psychology. Uh, could you elaborate on that, Freud and the new psychology? Well, it was basically a subversion. It was a decertification of reason. Uh, I mean, basically, Freud took the, the tripartite exi- uh, st- structure of the soul, which had existed from antiquity, which was basically uh, reason, a- uh, reason, will, and appetite. And he inverted it because he was a revolutionary. So he put appetite on top and said that the real enemy was now uh, uh, suppression of appetite. In this... Uh passage, it goes on to say that uh, Nathan Irvin Huggins traces white desire to Freud and the new psychology, which caused sophisticated people to deny the artifices of civility and manner, and to seek the true self through spontaneity and the indulgence of impulse. And then it goes on to say that the creation of Harlem as a place of exotic culture, according to Huggins, was as much a service to white need as it was to black. So essential has been the Negro personality to the white American psyche that black theatrical masks had become, by the 20th century, a standard way for whites to explore dimensions of themselves that seemed impossible through their own persona. Right. Yeah, it's like it's the noble savage. It's a variation on the noble savage. And so I suppose if, you know, it became, you know, like, for example, Irishmen would put on blackface and call themselves Abyssinians. And I think it was a way of uh, freeing yourself from the inhibitions of society because these people were seen as somehow more primitive and so therefore more in contact with basic desires and so on and so forth when they felt that the white society become too uptight and stultified. I don't think a lot of people realize today that back in the 20s, Harlem was a very popular place for the wealthy white couples. They'd go up there to enjoy the music and dance. Yeah. And of course... And the sexual liberation. It's, yeah. in, it's in Paul Tillich's wife's memoir. Hannah Tillich wrote a memoir about how Paul, Till, Paul Tillich, the great Protestant theologian, used to love to go to whorehouses, but in, when he came to New York, he, would, he went to Harlem. And uh, they talked about dancing at Small's Paradise because they felt that there was some type of liberation. The, the black, you know, the black people uh, are, are, you know, probably the most religious group in America uh, in terms of racial makeup, I guess. But uh, they were made to portray something. That and so what you did was you basically decertified anybody who wasn't your the, your idea of the Negro, and the Negro was basically the paradigm of sexual liberation. So the classic example was uh, Norman Mailer's uh, essay, The White Negro, which was basically the Jews' idea of what the Negro should be. And then you had something, somebody like uh, Eldridge Cleaver uh, in Soul on Ice, who would obviously, what we, what we probably, let's, let's be honest here, Eldridge Cleaver probably did not write Soul on Ice. It was probably written by the Jewish staff of uh, Ramparts magazine. So it probably came directly from... Norman Mailer's uh, White Negro. So when Negro, when uh, Nor- uh, Eldridge Cleaver supposedly says that he was a rapist and how he enjoyed raping white women, this is all pure uh, Norman Mailer. So it's basically the Negro is being made to play a role uh, to uh, as the sexually liberated kind of clown. Let's fast forward to uh, the 1960s and this... Uh cultural revolution, this uh, idea of free love, really begins to take root in the 60s, and uh, people like Kenneth Anger are on the forefront of this revolution. What uh, influence did uh, Kenneth Anger and his association with Aleister Crowley, what did what, what influence did Kenneth have on this uh, cultural revolution in the 60s? 
Well, he did. He did a thing called Scorpio Rising, which was one of the early pro homosexual uh, films. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't think Kenneth Anger is a major player here. He, he did a, a book called Hollywood Babylon. He's more of a. I think that the whole Satanism thing is is something that gets promoted. It's promoted by certain people who have certain uh, ends in mind. It's a little bit like homosexuality now. You know, it's not it's not that there are a lot of homosexuals out there, or there are probably more than there were a while ago. But certain groups promote these uh, homosexuals because they, they 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 it's a form of control. You know, homosexuals don't have children, they don't build families, they're isolated individuals, and so they're easy to kind of push around. They can be dom they're dominated by their appetites, they're easy to control, and so they become the paradigm for everyone else. And so this is the way I see someone like uh, Kenneth Anger, uh, you know, did these kind of weird films that we would go. I didn't even realize that they were kind of homosexual propaganda films when I watched them because uh, I saw them in the 60s when I would go to these art cinema places, and this was supposed to be the new new wave of film. But I think that the, the, real, the real promoter, uh, the real engineer of the 60s was Wilhelm Reich. And he's the guy who made it onto the cover of the New, new York Times magazine. And I think that uh, in in him we can see how this there are two two sides to the sexual liberation coin. There is the side of you get to gratify your appetites, but it turns out that when you do that, it becomes a form of control, and you ultimately lose your freedom. And I think that became the real paradigm of what was going on in the '60s. And you see that today uh, with the. Uh fact that uh, multiculturalism, multiracialism, traditionally needs a very strong police state to keep order. You know, this is how the Roman Empire was kept in line, and any other multiracial, multicultural empire, they, the, the use of a very, very uh, strong police state is necessary. Well, no, I think, actually, I think the opposite is true. I think that if if you control the culture, you don't need a strong police state. And I think the fact that we do have a strong police state emerging is the fact that this cultural cultural controls are starting to wear off. I think that's what we're beginning to see now. You know, I mean, you could you could talk about uh, you know, like let's say a, a minor uh, political correctness at Harvard. I first heard the term when my son went to Harvard in the early nineties. Well, the fact that they had to turn political correctness meant that they were really failing in their ability to control the the thoughts of the undergraduates. They had to re uh, revert now to explicit thought forms of thought control, and that's a sign of failure of the regime. And so I think the same thing is true of this increasing police state. It's a sign that uh, what, you, what you're seeing is failure here. The purpose of multiculturalism is to destroy the ethnic identity of every group so that everyone is just some great dif undifferentiated mass of people, and because that's easier to push around than groups that have their own ethnic identity. I would agree. However, the need for a police state, especially in this country, is very difficult to sell to the American public unless they see rampant crime, you know, incidences of drunk driving going off the hook. This is when the American public says, uh, yes, please take our freedoms away, implement your police state because we want to be safe. We want to feel secure in our homes. Uh, you, you see at the airports, people have allowed the government now to invade their privacy at the airport when they book a, book a flight. And they're doing this because they believe that they are more safe if they allow the government to have control of their privacy. Uh, this or it may be the opposite. It may be that this is imposed on people to convince them that there's a threat. Yeah, I would agree. The issue, though, I believe, is the, the conflicting cultures initially create violence. When you put together uh, enough cultures that have uh, opposing ideals and agendas, you see a rash of violence. The rash of violence uh, compels people to ask the government for help. Please bring order. There's too much violence in the city. I think that's true. I think, but uh, I think, that, that, for example, in the '60s, the orchestrated uh, racial violence is what uh, is an example of what we're talking about. Let's Ex say in Chicago. Exactly. You know, the uh, the using using the blacks from the south as your the shock troops 
the lumpen proletariat to drive the Catholic ethnics out of their neighborhood. The uh, one proof from my point of view, this is in my book, The Slaughter of Cities, uh, but uh, that uh, Sergeant Shriver gave the Blackstone Rangers a gang on the south side of Chicago, gave them a million dollars. Uh, when he knew, it came out in the church hearings, they knew they were involved in criminal activity. So why would you engage, why would you give criminals a million dollars? Well, to engage in criminal activity, that's why. Because that's what they, they wanted this black gang to create chaos to drive the, the Catholic ethnics out into the suburbs. So that was a type of orchestrated, uh, political violence that could be used uh, I mean, the call then, 68, uh, that election was for law and order. George Wallace came up with that. Nixon eventually took it over, and he got elected on that on that platform. So you can or- orchestrate chaos and then, uh, you know, orchestrate the solution to the chaos as well. I do agree with you, though. The net result the net result of all of this is to, to build a culture that is just neutral, making everybody the shade of gray, so to speak. It's uh, This seems to be the net result. To, to make a new world order where everyone is the same. Yeah. And, yeah, that seems to be the net, net result of all of this. Uh, Bernays, Edward Bernays, who was Freud's nephew, used this technique during the 50s. Uh, he was actually responsible for what was known as the Red Scare. He used fear to control the masses. This is something that uh, he uh, developed using the techniques of his uncle Freud. And you, you discuss Freud uh, in great detail in the book, Libido Dominandi. Can you uh, elaborate on Freud and his techniques and where he uh, borrowed some of his ideas? The, te- the technique was, uh, I think, taken from the Illuminati. There's evidence in his writings that uh, of, uh, uh, what should I say, phrases that were taken from the Illuminati manuscripts. The Illuminati were a group of uh, revolutionaries in Bavaria at the time, shortly before the French Revolution. Uh, The the, uh, documents were captured and published by the Prince of Bavaria, uh, the King of Bavaria, and uh, later found their way into Abbe Barrowell's book, The History of uh, Jacobinism, uh, and became a kind of Bible for revolutionaries. So Byron read it, and I, I'm convinced that Freud read it. And so basically what we're saying here is that you use uh, this, the, uh, the, the uh, Illuminati perversion of Jesuit spirituality. The examination of conscience becomes, in Freud's hands, psychoanalysis. They, they actually called it Seelenanalyse um, in the Illuminati, which is the German word for psychoanalysis. And so basically what you do is you uh, have the patient lie down and tell you his secrets, go to confession, and then at that point you use it against him. You use this as a form of control. And so what happened is that Sigmund Freud, uh, an American doctor, showed up, wanted to be certified as a psychoanalysis. His name was uh, Frank, and uh, confessed to Freud that he had this sexual attraction to his patient, one of his patients. So Freud told him, well... uh, Divorce your wife, marry the patient, who happened to be very wealthy, and then give me give me some of the money. Now this shows clearly that this was a form of uh, of social control. That was on the the micro level, and over the period of time with people like Bernays and and uh, Reich, what they did was evolve forms of control on the macro level, known as advertising, uh, public relations, you know, all the other things. That I cover in that book. In your book, uh, Libido Dominandi, on page 122, you uh, mention that uh, Freud described himself in his letters to Wilhelm Fleiss as a latter day Hannibal, a Semite who crossed the Alps, as Freud would have to do, on his way to Rome. Like Hannibal, Freud planned to approach Rome by indirection and thereby conquer it unawares. What did you mean by that? That Freud had this thing about Rome, m- meaning the Catholic Church, and that he wanted to destroy the Catholic Church, and he was going to do it by indirection, in other words, by uh, sexual subversion. That's that's pretty much what his plan was. And and how was he going to use sexual subversion? Uh, in other words, uh, what I'm asking is through his uh, techniques he developed. In psychoanalysis. Well, I mean, basically, basically, what would happen? You had a big contest at this point between Freud and Jung over who was going to get the rich Americans. 
who would come. Now, the, 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 like uh, the, uh, the scion of the McCormick family in Chicago shows up, and uh, Jung uh, puts him on the couch, and in the course, of, he just tells him he's having affairs with other women, and he feels guilty about it. So what happens is that Jung gives him permission to have the affairs, uh, so he gets to have his cake and eat it too, but that becomes a form of control. Freud did the same thing. He did it with uh, with Horace Frank. So all of these permission, you know, you allow the thing that the church prohibits, and so people are grateful for you uh, because you don't, they don't feel the guilt that they felt before for a while anyway, but you get control. Now, the, the difference is that this was on an individual level, but uh, as the ideas spread, it sort of decertified, uh, you know, moral restraint. Uh, the more the ideas got propagated. And then finally, as I said, Reich we, co- sort of politicized this whole idea and turned it into a, a form of mass control through mass promotion of sexual liberation. And lastly, uh, Michael, I want to thank you for coming on the program. But I have one last question here. In your book, Libido Dominandi, you have a on page 130, you write, Freud became the subversive Judeo-Mason that the anti-Semites had been warning the world about. Freud created a Jewish secret society to bring them to fruition in a conspiracy whose goal, like that of the Illuminati before him, was toppling of the throne and altar throughout Europe. Yeah, well, after the break with with Jung, Jung was supposed to be the Goy prince apparent. So after the break with Goy, Freud created a secret society among the Jewish inner circle of psychoanalytic profession and gave them all rings, and they became a kind of, as I said, a secret society. So, um, you know, the the spread of Freudianism after that, I say Judeo-Masonic because he was a member of B'nai B'rith, which is the Jewish Masonic Lodge. And the B'nai B'rith used to say that one of their goals was to spread the whole Freudian teaching. So that, you know, was a huge part of the cultural subversion of places like the United States during the first half of the 20th century. Does that secret society exist today, and in what form? No, no. It's, I think Freudianism is past. It's like talking about the Hussites, you know. It's, it's, it was a historical moment. It's gone. It's gone. Well, I want to thank you very much for uh, joining me on the program today, and I... Uh, Really look forward to reading your new book, The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. Where can we get this book? At culturewars.com. Go to culturewars.com and you can order a book. $48 uh, plus $8 shipping and handling. Or you can call Norma at 574-289-9786. And once again, Michael, please give us your web address. Uh, Jones at culturewars.com. And then That's my email address. You can find us on the web at culturewars.com. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate the opportunity to interview you, and uh, I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. 